Welcome back. I hope day one was fun and interesting. Today we'll get to learn about another flow developer tool, Playground. Also, we'll write our first smart contract and get to interact with it using scripts and transactions. Should be exciting. But first, let's review what we learned during day one, starting with Flow. Flow is a cool blockchain and Cadence is the programming language for writing decentralized applications on Flow. We also got to execute some of our first Cadence code using the Flow command line interface utility, using the Flow Cadence command, which launches a REPL shell, or Flow Cadence in the file name to execute scripts. We also got introduced to a few of the built-in types, integers, addresses, strings, arrays, and dictionaries, as well as optional types that allow us to define um, types or variables that can have the value nil or an absence of a value. Also, we touched on cadence functions, which are value types with named labels, very much like Swift. Cadence has two composite types, structures, which are value types, they're copied, and resources, which are linear types, they're moved and can only exist once. Cadence resources use a special arrow notation for movement, special keywords create and destroy for when you're creating and destroying your resources, as well as the at symbol to denote a resource type. For example, let canvas colon at canvas defines a canvas resource constant. We executed our first lines of cadence using the flow CLI cadence command it's a great way to get started when all we need is a programming language interpreter. However, decentralized applications are more than just interpreted code. They also interact with a global state, which is the blockchain. Flow provides us with a number of options to get started. A public testnet, a self-contained local flow emulator, and playgrounds. Today we're gonna to use playgrounds, but we'll tackle the other two later this week. Let's fire up our browser and open up play.onflow.org. It comes pre-populated with a lot of contract code, transactions, and scripts. But for what we're gonna do, I'm just gonna remove everything and start from scratch. Also, keep in mind that Flow Playground is only supported with Chrome. So other browsers, you're out of luck, you'll have to use Chrome. Now. There's five key sections of the playground interface. Let's take a look at each one. In the middle here, we have the cadence editor. This is where you'll store your cadence code. Because playground emulates the flow blockchain, there are special limitations that don't exist in the cadence REPL shell. You can only define contract, struct, and resource types when in the contract editor as opposed to the transaction or script editor, which you open up by selecting any account from the left pane here. Same goes for cadence events, but we'll touch on those later. Once you're ready to deploy a contract, hit the big green deploy button. The button to redeploy a contract will take its place after you first deploy your contract. Flow Playground allows you to update existing contracts However, it's known that sometimes updates can fail, and if you encounter a problem that shouldn't be there, try opening up a new playground and redeploying your contract there. Now, to the left, we have the accounts pane. In Flow, everything is stored with accounts, including smart contracts. So to do anything, you'll need to access one or more accounts. Thankfully, Flow play Playground provides us with five auto-generated accounts. This is a huge time saver. We don't have to worry about keys and you know, any, anything like that. One playground limitation is that each account can only have one contract deployed. Underneath, we have transactions. This is where you define flow transactions. Transactions are generally used to mutate the state of a blockchain and as such need to be signed by every party that's involved. As with every blockchain, flow blockchain, transactions have to be signed cryptographically 
using a private key to encode the transaction data. Thankfully, Playground abstracts this and signing transactions is a one click effort. Underneath transactions, we have scripts. The scripts pane is where you define flow scripts, which are read only programs that don't require any blockchain mutations. As such, they don't incur a gas fee, unlike transactions, even though Playground doesn't have any fees, but still. And they don't require authorization from any account. Underneath the Cadence Editor, we have the Login Storage pane. Cadence provides us an awesome quality of life feature for developers, which is the log function. You can log variables, see how state changes as your program is executed. And we already got to experience this with the flow cadence um, command in the terminal. Playground is the only other place that lets you see your log outputs. You won't be able to see log outputs when you uh, move on to testnet. In the bottom pane, you'll also find the account storage information, but that pops up only when there's something being stored with accounts. With our environment out of the way, let's create our first Cadence smart contract. Let's select 01 from the accounts pane and focus on the Cadence code editor. We'll create a simple contract that says hello using the contract keyword. We'll have one function, say hi, should be familiar by now, string, and we're gonna log hi, comma, and concatenate that with the name. All right, now we hit deploy. Once the contract is deployed, we'll get confirmation in our logs that says deployed contract to zero one. At this point, you'll see the name of the contract you deployed displayed underneath the zero one account in the accounts pane. The name in this case is taken directly from the source code, but outside of Playground, you deploy contracts with a name that's a string and the contract source code. So each account can have multiple instances of the same contract under different names. As mentioned previously, Playground accounts only support one contract each. Okay, now that we have a blockchain program deployed, let's interact with it. Flow provides two distinct ways to do this. Scripts, which are anonymous and read only, and transactions, which are authenticated, can mutate blockchain state, and are cryptographically signed. We'll do one of each to see them in practice. We'll click on script to begin writing our first script. All right, so this is a familiar interface. We have a blank screen with Cadence, um, with the Cadence editor. So let's get started with a, an entry point. And now that we have an entry point to interact with a contract, we have to import the contract from an account that is hosting it. So we're gonna import hello from zero one. All right. Inside of our main function, we can now declare a name. Let's do fast forward and we can call functions within the contract and provide us the name. Okay. Click on execute and you'll see two lines in the log pane where line number one says hi fast forward, which is what we expected. And line number two says result type void. You normally fetch information about public state using scripts, so it's expected that they return some kind of value. In our case, we're not explicitly returning anything, but similar to JavaScript, when functions return undefined if there's no explicit return value, in Cadence, functions without explicit return statements return the void type. Now, moving on to transactions. For reference, please use the documentation. Our script was able to interact with a public function of the hello contract with transactions, 
we can add authorized accounts into the mix. Let's write our first transaction after opening the transaction templates pane and selecting transaction. So we'll go ahead and import hello from zero one and we open up our transaction object with the keyword transaction and we're going to declare a name that's a string this is a local variable for the transaction and um, we're going to declare two phases a prepare phase and an execute phase. So execute is going to be where the main logic happens and we're just going to log we're just going to say hi to the name that's stored within self.name. Now prepare is where we have access to the account that's authorizing this transaction. So uh, this is where we're going to store our name. And for name, we're just going to use the account address and we're going to convert that to string. All right, now that we have the code in front of us, let's dig deeper into what it all means. Same as with scripts, we begin by importing all the contracts that we'll be interacting with, in this case, hello. Then we declare the transaction body and its contents. Each transaction has four phases that are sequential. However, they're all optional. And the phases are the prepare phase, the pre phase, the execute phase, and the post phase. If you want to share data between the four phases, we can declare local variables inside the transaction body, just like we did right here. But no access modifiers are needed because this is only accessed within the transaction. The prepare phase is where we have direct access to account storage and other private functionality provided by an instance of auth account. For now, we're just going to use the address field, which is also available in the public account. Um, but for later, we're going to have to use um, prepare statements for borrowing references, creating resources and so forth. You can learn more about auth account in the documentation. Then moving on to the execute phase. In this phase, you should store the main logic for your transaction. You may not access private auth account objects here, but assuming that you've done everything correctly, uh, you've used the local variables to store any kind of resources that you borrowed or created, within the prepare phase, and you can then use those in the execute phase. For now, we're only gonna need the prepare and execute phases. And in our prepare phase, we grab the account address and store it for later access in the execute phase. And in the execute phase, we call the say hi function of the hello contract using the signing account address for the name argument. Let's go ahead and execute this transaction. In the transaction signer um, pane, pick one account, any account, and click send. All right, you should see the log pane updating with the different account addresses. Um, if we select 02, click send, it says hi 02. So we're directly interacting with these accounts through transactions. Now that we're familiar with the flow playground, we can start transitioning our pixel art logic from day one into a smart contract. For that, I'm gonna select account zero two and copy over a whole bunch of code. Let's go through it one by one. The editor, by the way, provides a neat folding functionality. So our artist um, contract mostly contains things that should be familiar with a few additions. Starting with everything being wrapped in a contract, you can't declare anything outside of a contract when it comes to flow, as opposed to the cadence interpreter REPL shell. Then you can see an implementation of 
the printer resource, which is going to print unique canvas structures. I used a dictionary to enforce this, but you can also achieve the same results with an array. Let's fold that up. Finally, there's the init initializer. This is where we set things up for the contract host account. In the initializer, we have access to self data account, which is of the familiar auth account type and provides us with full private access to the account. We're calling a couple of functions here. Let's explore what they do. These two functions, save and link, are part of the account storage API. With these methods or functions, we're able to persist an instance of printer and provide others with access to it. Let's explore each one separately and see how to use them. So save. Everything that we want to persist on the flow blockchain, we have to store with an account. The same function does exactly that. We give it a value, in this case, a resource, a printer resource, and a unique location where to store it. You define a path where to store things in two parts. The first part is called the domain, and there are three possible domains. Storage, which is the actual location of a value, and we're going to only use storage with save, or rather in save, we can only use storage. Then there's also public, which is sort of like an API access that we provide to our storage. Public accounts can get access to slash public domain and slash private, which it must be accessed using the auth account. For reference, please use the docs as well. Then we have link. So if we simply stored an instance of printer with the contract account, everyone that wanted to print a canvas as a picture would require authorization a signature from the contract account. That's cumbersome and we want to allow everyone to print their pictures freely. Cadence employs capability-based access control to allow smart contracts to expose parts of their storage to other accounts. And by calling link, we create a capability. So the first argument is the capability path. Please pay attention to the uh, keyword public. And this is a unique identifier. Same as storage, but there are different domains, so they can be the same name because they have different domains. And the second argument is the target, which is the actual um, object that we'll interact with once we get a capability. The thing to pay attention to is within these angle braces, we angle brackets, we define what kind of a reference type this link is. And What's, what's a reference, right? So references we can, re we can create for both resources and structures, and they give us access to fields and functions of the object we're referencing. You can create a reference, I'm just gonna type something here, um, using um, syntax, like for example, set a name, and let's create a name reference. So that's gonna be and string as string. So this created a name reference, or you can borrow a reference using capabilities. And so we're creating a link that's creating a capability. Later on, we'll be able to borrow it using a syntax that's um, a lot like this. Okay, so we're taking an account. Since this is a public domain capability, we can use um, get account, which uh, gives us access to public account. We define the specific reference type. 
and we borrow a reference from this capability. Now, after this completes, if there's no panic, we have access to all the fields and functions of the underlying object. We have ourselves a new smart contract and we learned about capabilities and account storage. Let's deploy some of that knowledge with a transaction. So let's create a new transaction in our pane here. Let's call this second transaction. All right, and let's type it out. Don't forget, typing something out is a lot better than copy pasting because um, you get to absorb a lot more information that way. All right, so we create a transaction. Let's define some variables. We're gonna pick in some pixels. We're gonna store a picture temporarily. So we're namespacing the picture resource because it comes from the artist smart contract because it's not available outside of it. And we go into our prepare statement where we take an account and we're going to borrow a printer reference. So we get an account. Now the, let's deploy this by the way. All right, so the artist smart contract exists with zero two. So same with the printer resource. So we just get the zero two account. And from there, we fetch the capability that exists at this address. So public slash artist picture printer. All right. One thing I forgot is we have to type this. So the type is going to be artist dot printer reference. Okay. Now that we have the capability, we can borrow a reference from it. If something unexpected happens, for example, if we don't have the printer resource under this um, public address, um, we'll get null from this um, capability borrow. So we're just gonna print out a panic and uh, stop executing this transaction right here. So couldn't borrow printer reference, all right? So now let's store some pixels. I like the letter X, so I'm just gonna copy in the pixels for letter X. Uh, we're gonna create a canvas, artist.canvas. That takes in a width. Since we have printer reference, we initialize it with a five by five grid. So that's what we're gonna use right here. And the pixels are gonna come from self.pixels. All right, so we have a canvas. We're ready to print. Let's take self.picture and, and move a newly printer ref dot print a newly printed canvas. Okay, so prepare is done. Now we can declare our execute phase. Here we're going to do a simple uh, log statement where if self dot picture is equal to nil, meaning most likely the printer found an existing canvas um, and it refused to print um, a duplicate canvas. Or if we have a picture, we're gonna log picture printed, okay? And otherwise we're just gonna log 
picture already exists. All right. Now, um, the playground is um, giving us um, a, 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 an error. We have to dispose of our picture resource. We don't have a place to store it just yet. Okay. Let's clear the log and test this out. All right. First go, we got a picture printed. Let's see if we run it a second time. Picture already exists. Cool. So we can see that our printer is acting as we want it to. We can also look at the storage pane under artist picture printer and see that our prints dictionary does contain a key that looks a lot like the letter X pixels that we sent it to. That's it for day two content. I know we've covered a lot and there's gonna be links to documentation on the official GitHub readme. Uh, I suggest you take a look at that whenever you run into any questions. We're also gonna be available on Discord as always. Lastly, uh, we have two quests for today. Uh, W1Q3, which is my precious. Um, for that quest, you have to create a collection, collection resource that will be able to store our pictures. So now we no longer have to destroy them once we print them. And it's gonna be a pretty fun um, exercise. And we also have W1Q4, which is connoisseur. For that quest, you have to write a script um, that's going to print out the contents of a uh, accounts collection. Please use the um, beautiful framing functions that you wrote for day one to have nice printouts for those. That's it. Um, good luck with your requests, and I'm going to catch you during office hours.